Thank you for being here. I hope the colors will be all right, because that should be green. So, I don't know. Uh, my name is Pius Flores. I'm from the Netherlands. I run a company. We produce um, mycorrhizal spores, specific spores. We produce bacteria for um, increasing soil life. I'll explain something about that. Um, and I hope that we will have a good time. If you have questions, anytime. If you don't get it, if I speak really strange European English, tell me. Um, so, welcome, and um, I, there's more coming in, have a seat, there's plenty. Um, soil biology and rhizosphere biology. I want to start with that, because there's, there are two different worlds. There is soil biology, but please take in your mind that in most soil that you work on, you will have no roots. Roots only take 4 to 7% of your total soil volume. So, root biology and soil biology are two really different things. Um, actually, I was very proud to meet uh, John here. Uh, nice. He, he made uh, the films Green Gold. And in one of these films, he made, um, he made recordings. He made a film on our, one of our projects that we had in Spain. It is finished. It was 150 acres of dead soil. I mean, barren, dead, eroded soil. No more topsoil, almost bedrock. And in three years' time, we changed this soil in highly productive agricultural land that with, uh, it was rain-fed, 400 mil per year, and only in the winter. So we were able to catch the water, and we managed to make that high productive land in three years' time. Um, and we produced more oats and uh, some other crop uh, than the neighbor, with a chemical fertilizers and a pivot. So um, that system is being adapted now in, in Spain, large parts of Spain. And John uh, put that into the film that made us quite famous in Europe. Plants don't need us. Plants can grow anywhere. And how, how do you ever fertilize these plants. How, do you, how can trees grow here? Or here? If you want to measure if you have soil compaction, <laughs> think twice. Or here. This is very yellow sand. Yellower than, uh, because in my computer it's brown. But just for the figure. How can these trees grow in Abu Dhabi? The water there is 70, 70 meters deep. How do these trees do that? Well, it, it starts with, they eat stone. Plants live of rocks. They live of minerals. And how these minerals are made, I don't need to explain that to you. It is being shaped by nature. It's being created by nature and by waterways. And sometimes you have problems with the minerals that move around. So we know all this. Now, but it started somewhere else, and that's one of the things I want to give to you. I want to give it to you to think about it. We had, we had chemical fertilizers before we had the first agricultural education. Basically, 
everybody involved in agriculture started on the wrong foot. Because we have learned that roots absorb water and minerals. Well, there's one thing they don't, and that's absorbing water and minerals. They do a lot, but not that. So we have to rethink a lot. Yes, water absorb water, um, roots absorb water and minerals if you push it in the root with synthetic fertilizers driven by nitrogen, osmotic pressure, and ionic exchange. That's the scientific part of mineral uptake. And by the way, plants don't take minerals up. They absorb nutrients, not minerals. You couldn't eat salad if the plant would eat minerals. You would lose your teeth, would be cracking. They take up minerals in the form of nutrients. So this is a drawing of the, in, of the European lab of Justus von Liebig. There he is, the father of the fertilizing technology. Today, it's a museum. It's supported by a pharmaceutical company, as you might think, <laughs> um, because they, they really have, uh, they think it's important that you keep buying their products. Um, this is the oven, the original oven uh, or stove where, um, where he burnt ashes or burnt plant particles to find out which mineral was deficient. It's quite interesting laboratory for that time especially, but let's face it, that technology is 160 years old and hasn't changed a bit. Where, especially in organic farming, there is a lot going on, and we have to step away from the idea that plants only need 16 minerals. That's crazy. So, all, all of our practices are pretty confusing. And why are they confusing? It starts with the word potassium. You call kalium potassium, that's fine. But why don't we call kalium what it is, kalium? Why does it need to be called potassium? For, for what reason? Is that a habit? Because it's not potassium. It's not. What potassium is, and that was, uh, that was already written by the Romans 400 years after Christ. Hey, sorry for that. It's kalium chloride. That's what you put on your ground, on your soil. And look at kalium. Where is kalium? There. Kalium is a sister of sodium. Kalium is a straightforward sister of sodium chloride. Yeah, but it's really important for water transport. Absolutely. It's really important to move the minerals. Absolutely. I don't disagree with that. But I invite you, oh, and another beautiful word, turgor. Turgor, cell turgor, cell tension. Yeah? I invite you to eat salt for a week and see how your turgor is. <coughs> That's what we do to our plants. I'm not kidding. You, we actually ask insects and fungi, please take this plant. The cells are about to explode. Nitrogen is the first most common element on Earth. The second one is silicon, silicium, as I. The second most abundant mineral on Earth. Plants need nitrogen. And in, in an evolution of more than 450 million years, they don't use silicon. Where is silicon in our fertilizing schemes? It's there, 
it's called sand. Sand. Plants love sand. And they love the minerals in the sand. However, hard to reach. So, if I take pure potassium from a potassium mine and I put a brick in it, and I invite you to do this because this is practical science, you can do this. Throw a brick in pure kalium and look what happens. Now, if you have a clay soil that you heavily fertilize with kalium, you will find out that the clay becomes smaller and smaller. The same goes for sand, but it takes longer. So it breaks down even the smallest clay particles, leaving less oxygen in the soil, leaving more compacted soil. So you need heavier equipment to plow that soil. And when I see this anywhere I go in the world, I see farmers, both organic and non-organic farmers, I see, I see them with heavy equipment in the field, trying to plow their fields. Besides the fact that plowing is just about the worst you can do with your soil, besides that, farmers are used to it. And since I come from the Netherlands, plowing is a real big thing in the Netherlands. And one time a farmer made a very nice remark. I was talking about plowing with them, and the farmer said, a piece, but I like it. <laughs> That's an honest answer. He likes it. Thermos, coffee, GPS, nice. You can, be all day, you can be out all day, radio on, music, and we plow ahead. But it's really not a practice. So I said to him, well, that, why don't you put a hectare that's 2.47 acres. Uh, why don't you put a hectare next to your farm and you can plow all year? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have enough hectares? Make that your play garden. That was, uh, he didn't like that. Um, <laughs> so I'm talking about kalium. And we have come a long way. We have come a long way since the Dust Bowls. Here in the States, in the Midwest, in Canada, Saskatchewan, Alberta, where thousands of people had to flat, flee. Why? Because of two things only. Nitrogen and what you call potassium, which is kalium. Because potassium is another thing. It's another word. Potassium comes from the Romans. 400 after Christ, the Romans wrote, you have to spread potassium on your field because it's a Latin word and it means the ashes from wood fire. Pot ash. And nothing else. It's the ash from wood fire. And what do you need to get ash? You have to burn trees. Well, there is not a single tree in the world that is present on this earth without mycorrhizae. I've heard, overheard these discussions a million times. Well, trees, they don't need to mycorrhize it. It's not even a discussion. They need it and it's there. Often in weak condition, not always in the colonization amounts that you want. It depends on many factors, but it's there. So these trees, they pick up easily 60 elements. 60 elements that, in the form of nutrition, turn back to, to minerals when you burn these trees. And let's not mistake. Let's not make a mistake. Fuel before we had uh, enough electricity and enough fossil fuels, 
we depended on wood to build our houses, to warm our houses, to, keep, to cook our food. Even, um, never mind. So, wood was for us very important. And uh, have we been deforesting the world? Yes. Uh, will we do, uh, keep doing that? Yes. That's okay if you replant enough. But, and we will always need wood. But that wood that went to the baker's ovens, because every bakery, and I'm almost 65, and I come from a time where the bakeries in my village were still burning wood. And there's two more people here who know that time. Um, so, and the ashes from these wood fires, they were collected. They went into a bin to cool down, and they were transported to what we call in the Netherlands potash factories. And they made two things out of it, fertilizer and soap. And they went to chemical, uh, chemical factories where they made fertilizer and soap out of it. So that was the ash. That is potassium. That is real potassium. And that potassium contained a lot of minerals. Because we talk about 16 elements that you apply to plants. Forget it. Forget it. It's more than 30. And if you, would have to, if you would have to live from 16 elements, you would be dead next week. It's impossible to live on 16 elements only. So, oh, I was ahead of my talk. This is the oven. Okay. No, it's not in the tree. Unless you burn the roots, then it's in the roots. But, but usually you burn the stem and the branches. Okay, sorry, I thought you were going down. Yeah. Okay, so that's potassium. That's real ashes. That's a collection bin with handles to empty it in a truck that would bring it to the potash factories. The same happened here. What did the bakeries in the early days of the settlers with their ashes? would be spread on the land. We had sources for that in Holland. We had willows, willow trees. We still have them. But they're considered to be cultural inheritance. So you have to have volunteers to cut these trees every four years, and the branches are burned. But they, that was not the case. These branches, they were used for everything, building dikes, uh, uh, burning wood ovens, um, to keep the cattle uh, from trampling the sides to the, to the ditch. So, this was a cultural thing. Every village, every city had these willows that will be pruned and pruned and pruned every time. These are elements that you will find in ashes. But I've never read anything on lantanum. I've never ever heard about cerium. I've never heard about neodymium. Dimonium. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so these elements are present in almost every form of ash. So we have to rethink plant health there. Because these elements are required. And calcium and kalium, which you call potassium, magnesium, sil silicon, and phosphor are the main constituents of wood ash. So the rare earth elements, as we now call them, they're never taken into consideration when it comes to fertilizing practices. You won't see it on, an, on the, any analysis. How, how did you call it? I forgot. Analysis paralysis. analysis paralysis. Thank you. Because all these analysis that I see every week, they turn me crazy. I don't know what to do with it. Uh, besides the fact that they don't even, 
They're, they're not even good enough. They're either water-soluble-based water or acid-soluble-based. What kind of acid? How is it measured? And, and you might know that if you send one soil sample to four labs, you will have four answers. You will have four um, analysis. So if you want to make plans for that, stick with one lab. <coughs> Otherwise, it drives me nuts. <laughs> so we, we have to look at di a different way of fertilizing. Because this is a great example. We have what we call abiotic stresses. Are you familiar with that? Plants can get very sick from rain. Where, where are we? Since when will plants get sick from rainfall? That's crazy. Or from heat or cold or salt or flooding. flooding. Plants have survived for 460 million years. They don't need us. We need them. Big time. So we have to be biotic stresses, but how are they caused? What's the reason for these diseases? Because the next question in, our, in agriculture should be not, how do I get rid of that insect? How do I uh, avoid that um, grubs eat my roots? The question is going to be, what's wrong with my plant? Why is that insect eating my plant? That's a good reason for everything. Why is it eating my plant? Well, one of the answers I have for that is undernourishment. They are hungry. They don't get what they need. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know anything about medicines. But for plants, I know they have an excellent defense system. Jasmonic acid, salicylic acid, excellent defense factors for plants. But they need to be activated. They need to have a function. So I figured for the next half hour, I would... I would amuse you with this picture and explain everything here. No, sorry, it was a joke. <laughs> These are called calcium channels. When you measure calcium in your plant sap analysis or your leaf analysis, if you measure your plant sap uh, in, in your sap, the, the calcium levels, it doesn't say too much. It's not really valuable for one reason only. I was talk talking about kalium, right? What you call potassium. And it makes cells swell. It gives turgor. It makes tension on the cells. What does it mean? That individual cells are squeezed to another. And that means that these calcium channels are squeezed. That means that calcium is not able to enter the plant cell. It's a physical process. And if it's not entering the cell, then it will not be able to switch on the genes, because calcium is very important in switching on and off genes. And that means if calcium is not entering the cell, the plant will not be able to produce salicylic acid, jasmonic acid, phenolics, etc. It will disable the cell to perform the way it should because of too much calcium. And kalium is the seventh abundant mineral on Earth. It's everywhere. But it's not easy for roots to reach out to kalium. 
That is because roots are not made for absorption. They're simply not made for absorption. We're being told, but they're not. And when it comes, and I'm, I'm a father of seven children. I know. Um, I know. And the problem is they're all really intelligent and they all studied. And it's very expensive. Anyway, we're recovering slowly. And, um, but I've been feeding my children supplements all their life. All their life. Why? Because we don't get enough. I'm not a medic, but it's, you call it a gut feeling, that's good enough for me. That's the recommended dose of minerals. This is what we should have. This is what we get in, in the average diet. Iodine, we get enough. But you see, we, we don't eat well enough. We don't get all the elements in, in a regular diet that we should. This presentation will be online with uh, BFI. So if you look at the elements in our, in our body, you see that half, half of the elements in our body count for less than 1%. So, that 1% are non-essentials. Well, I would suggest that we create a new term. We call these essential elements and we call these beneficial elements. But you've got to give them a name. Because they have a place. So we have the, ele the elements or necessary elements and the beneficials. Do we know what they actually do? No. We don't. The same for plants. It's analyzed that we have a, like 1% non-essential elements. Oh yeah, recently we talk about copper and selenium. There's some research on cerium and lantanum. But basically, that is one group, but different elements. So we don't know what they mean yet, because we've never been looking. And believe me, the whole world is looking. Even Syngenta, is, which is a pharmaceutical company that you might know, uh, even Syngenta is looking. Why can't we get plants to grow to their full genetic potential? This is what we reach without chemicals, they say. This is what you reach, uh, reach with chemicals. And why can't you reach this level? Why are we not succeeding in growing plants to the full genetic potential, and some people do. And some people say, wow, I have corn as big as I've never had before. It's starting, it's coming. It's not coming in con conventional ag agriculture. It will not come there, because with chemical fertilizers, you disturb the total system. So with, I have a huge faith in organic fertilizing and organic agriculture because the conventional agriculture has not proven to be able to feed people properly, let alone the world. That's, that, I don't know where that comes from, but that's total crap. I'm sorry. It's, it's really, I've, there's more than 50,000 publications on mycorrhizae and more than 60% is total crap. If you look at the colonization rate only, I can, we have a mycorrhizal laboratory within the company. People say, with high phosphates, you have no colonization, or very low colonization. 
these mycorrhizal hyphae, they go out. They are being sent by the plant, paid by the plant. Go out and come back with minerals. And after, and of course, most hyphae die because they, they don't find their symbionts, and a few find their symbionts. And they get a connection. They wrap around phosphate, for instance. But if there's enough phosphate, why would you send out 1,000 hyphae? If two do the job. So, and that's the mistake, because in, in mycorrhizal analysis, and, and your question is totally valid, this is a non-mycorrhizal root. And this is a mycorrhizal root. This is how you look at mycorrhizae. This is the only way how you look at endomycorrhizae. Under the microscope, 100 times enlarged and dyed. So you see the external hyphae there. If the phosphate is readily available, we, and I don't have it here, we have photographs, that you have very thick hyphae, only one or two. And they do the job for the plant. Um, you know, with these little trace elements, the, the beneficials, I compare it to, with my car. And there's this little box with all these little things. I don't need them. Who needs that? And if I have a shortcut in the car, I can repair it with aluminum foil or, or a nail. So I don't need that. They're built in securities. And it would be nice to look at the beneficial elements as the fuses, as the built-in securities for your fertilizing plan. So what, what is becoming popular in the Netherlands and here as well, I have been reading that in, on the uh, small trade show outside, rock dust amendment. Do we know exactly what's in there? No. But it's precaution management. If you, if you have been farming for hundreds of years on the same soil, then, um, and you only supply a number of elements, it wouldn't hurt to make sure that you increase the amount of elements in your soil. And applying rock dust is always a lot cheaper than trying to find whether these minerals are yes or not present in your field. So we have to look at things another way. We have to look at soil fertility in another way. That was supposed to be a joke, but. <laughs> and even some of the most plow addicted farmers in the Netherlands, they now start spraying or spreading their rock dust. And they see positive effects. They see it. There's a, there's a lot of American literature on, on rock dust. And I think this is really important as a takeaway. And then, how do you, how do you measure that? Uh, there's all kinds of ways to measure things. And we work a lot with just the ordinary uh, bricks meter. And I wanted to point you at one thing. Usually, you see a pretty straightforward line. If, who uses the bricks meter here? Refractometer, hand? Oh, yeah. Do you often see a broken line, a very diffuse line? That's a good sign, because these are onions from exactly the same soil exactly the same soil, differently treated. And after more than a year, we saw the differences. Same fertilizing schedule, as far as fertilizers go, and we saw the blurred line. And the blurred line means more dissolved elements. So that could be convenient for you, because this this tells me this is organic, this is non-organic. 
because that's a sharp line. And a sharp line means a limited amount of dissolved minerals. So, and whether it's Europe or, or the United States or anywhere in the world, the regulatory frameworks for crop inputs were designed when scientists had a much simpler understanding of plant growth. And it's true. So we, what we need to do is we need to change the law. We need to change laws when it comes to agriculture because what we are in at this moment is a huge mishap. And it needs to be repaired. Because even in the most actual literature, you will find these type of drawings. How plants absorb water and minerals. It's not even close to the reality. So roots do not absorb water and minerals. And there's nothing new to what I say. The thing is, there is so much information and it's so widespread. Putting everything in a database would be a very good idea. It would be a very good idea. Because all of you, you have to search. If you want to learn something, you have to search for it. And you don't know, often you don't know what, what to search for. So what you discover is most of the time coincidental. Soil needs three, has three requirements. Almost all literature that I read says chemical, physical, and biological. Biological at the last place. <coughs> biological should be at the second place. Physical. Yeah, that's something, but that's done by the plant. I will explain it to you. Like you and me, we have budgets. Whether it's in your house, whether it's in your family, or whether it's in your company, you have a budget that you work with. Otherwise, you don't know what happens. So plants have a budget as well. Because they have... We have our daily expenses, plants do too. We want to save up some money, plants do too. We pay taxes, plants do too. And in our economic system, this fits. And we pay about 35% tax or more, so do plants. Plants pay taxes. Where do these taxes go? They call them exudates. The, the taxes what, that plants pay are called exudates. And these exudates, I will bring you further, these are the root tips that you see. This is a root tip. This is elongating, and in the process of elongating, there's no root hairs. And after they have formed root hairs, these are the only absorbing organs from the whole plant. The root hair are the only absorbing organs. Can you now imagine how little roots you have in the soil? How few? So, and you can see here, this is a root hair enlarged. It's with the exudates outside, and this is a little bigger. You can see the, all the little droplets from the root hairs that shed the exudates into the soil. Why would they do that? And besides, these root hairs, they live three days. An absorbing root lives up to three weeks. And not longer. But the plant has to make roots first. So the plant is paying the root system. 
Here is money. Here is your sugar. Go out and come back with water and minerals. And after three weeks, the plant becomes impatient. What's up down there? Hello? <laughs> Boss, I've been looking around. I cannot find my symbionts. I cannot find what I need here. And I don't know what to do. Well, you're fired. And the root is cut off, literally cut off, by a chemical called suberin. And the root dies off, and a new root comes, and a new root comes, and a new root comes. So plants are really, really busy with making new roots all the time because there are so little in the soil that they can work with. And why do you have to, that, why do you have, to have that complicated system first? Well, very simple. What do you need to have hair on your head? Qu that's a question. What do you need to have hair on your head? <laughs> well, at least you have a good start. You need a head. <laughs> so, really, you have to have roots first. And second come in the bacteria and the mycorrhizal fungi. The root is first. It's a pioneer. Therefore, roots live up to three weeks. If they don't find symbionts, they're cut off. If they do find their symbionts, they will live up to two years. That doesn't make sense for vegetables, but for uh, shrubs and plants it does. And when we talk about the rhizosphere, I'm not going to make it easier on you. This is what we call the bulk cell microbiome. That is, and you have to forgive me, that is not so relevant for the plant. We have influence on the bulk soil microbiome with the quality of the compost that we deliver, with the quality of the fertilizer that we deliver. That's what we have influence on, direct. And is that good? Yes, that could be very good because now the soil could start building humus. And humus is different lecture. It's a total different game. But then we talk about the rhizosphere soil microbiome. That, that means the soil which is in between the root and uh, it's the film that's in between the soil and the root. R it will come later back. Roots grow in the soil but have no contact with the soil. That will come. So that's the gel where the root swims in. Now you have uh, uh, many colonies of bacteria that actually grow really close to the root. Really close. They, they have defensive properties, um, transforming properties. And then you have the endosphere microbiome. And the endosphere microbiome is already present in the seed. I know that we all wash our salads before we put them on the table to clean them. But you don't have to do that uh, to get rid of the bacteria. Um, there's always a thousand-fold bacteria in your salad than on your salad. Try to wash that off. Or you can chlorinate your salad. Uh, but anyway, that's the endosphere microbiome, and th there's not much. There's not a much difference with our gut system. There's, th there's a lot of si similarities there. So, and they're really busy. Bacteria have numerous functions. I, I really don't want to go into that, but they are incredibly important for every life support system in any plant. But bacteria, they communicate. Most of them have hairs or they have a tail and they communicate. They talk to each other. They talk to each other. Here is a food source. We can live of this food source. And they start growing. They start multiplying. A bacterial population doubles itself, 
in 20 minutes at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. That's a rule of fist. So the bigger the population of these bacteria, the stronger the signals. They call that probiotics. They make their own probiotics. They encourage their own family to grow. Until a point where the food source can no longer support that whole colony. Well, usual, it's an ongoing system. But it means at the same time that in, and they do that in a second, they change the signals. And they change the signals, and then they start making antibiotics on their outside. And I don't know if there's a biologist here, microbiologist maybe? No? Hands? No? Try me. Try me with, with a Petri dish. Put two infected pieces of whatever, cheese or anything. Put it on a Petri dish. What you will see is that the colonies might grow, but when they reach each other, you will have a brown overflow. They will never, ever, never, ever go into each other. Fungi cannot take each other's place. So, and that's one of the problems that we have in agriculture, because if for whatever reason you lose, you lose bacterial populations, for whatever reason, they're not likely to return by themselves. Natural restoration of soil is a very limited phrase, because it might take you thousands of years or hundreds of years or three years. We don't know. We don't know what we don't know. But there will, be, there will always be bacteria everywhere. Always. So I learned the phrase from Logan, musical chairs. That's a game. And if you leave your chair, someone else will take your place. And the same happens in the soil. So if you want to remove somebody from, the, from that chair, what do you need to bring them? Force. Take the chair away. That's mean. <laughs> you have to use force. So what have we discovered? If you want to bring in natural, natural bacteria, rhizosphere bacteria back, because we don't care about the soil bacteria. It's too much. We don't understand it. We know nothing about it. And it may change in one day. Because the bacteria from your shoes now enter the soil. Or from the tractor wheels. Or from the plow that you don't use, of course. So, the bacterial populations change multiple times. And they go up and down, and depending on the temperature, you have more or less, etc. But we want these rhizobacteria near the roots, because we don't know what happened with that soil. Trying to analyze these rhizobacteria is a very expensive job, because you have to make primers for that. So you can actually find these bacteria. And we thought we need to solve this problem. And we, we actually grow six species of rhizobacteria. Rhizobacteria are bacteria that depend on the sugars in the exudates from the roots. So they always stay around that root, like this. And when I say root, I'm sorry, I don't mean this size of stuff. I mean the root hairs. This is 20 micron. I talk about the root hairs. 
and then these exudates, uh, the bacteria are going in and out. They're actually being pushed out. Uh, uh, that, that's too much for now. The erythrosphere bacteria live off the root exudates. Now, and the problem with chemical fertilizers in, in non-organic farming is that these tissues of sugar are being neutralized by the salts of the fertilizer. And that kills off, it kills off the rhizosphere bacteria because they don't have the right pH to live in anymore and they're gone. So even, I'm not kidding, even two years of chemical fertilizer use on a piece of land is enough to destroy the soil biota. You will have other bacteria, but that's not the plant's choice. And the plant is the only soil improver. Plants work their ass off to get a better growing condition by pumping sugars in the soil, hoping that the right bacteria will bring them the right stuff. And that's not the 16 elements that we are used to give. Like I said, plants' roots grow in the soil but have no contact with the soil. They grow in the macropores, as we call. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I couldn't download the English version. The space between the micropores is too small for root growth. It's not enough. Water and minerals are, for the most part, in the micropores. And mycorrhizae fungi grows in the micropores. So that's what they actually do. This is a part of the film that we have for free for use by anyone on our website. It's in 12 languages. If you like it in Hindi or Chinese, go ahead. This is what happens in these micropores. Root. Roots grow in the soil, but have no contact with the soil. Now, you probably recognize this picture. These are roots, and these are mycorrhizal hyphae. These are the roots, and these are the mycorrhizal hyphae. I have seen this picture during this conference, I believe, three times. I'm happy people use this picture, but it's our picture, it's mine. <laughs> there, copyright. I bought that picture from Reed. And a long, long time ago. But anyway, it's a beautiful picture, and I love the, the work that he did. So this root here is too young to harbor mycorrhizae. And this is ectomycorrhizae. Ecto means outside. It grows partly around the root, partly in the root, but not in the cells. Anyway, these are the hyphae, and these are the roots. So you can imagine what happens in plants if they have a mycorrhizal system. And look here. These are aggregates. There's a root. Maybe that was a, a, a worm hole or from a nematode or a round worm. And you, said, you see the roots grow in between. I compare the soil with an apartment building. These are typical European apartment buildings. They have an elevator shaft, probably an, another one on the other side. You have staircases and you have galleries. Where do people store their food? In the elevator shaft? On the galleries, yeah, maybe a crate of beer, but that's it. People store their food in the fridge and in the kitchen cabinets. Roots will never, ever be able to grow there. They just can't. They're too thick, 0.2 millimeter. It's ridiculously thick. So what have we learned? Who, who is a uh, question? Who knows what a tensiometer is? 
A tensiometer is to determine the moisture level in your soil. Yeah? Tensiometer. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm Dutch. <laughs> so, what have we learned in our agricultural practices? And this might sound like a joke, but I'm dead serious. We have learned to fill the elevator shafts and the galleries with water. And we call that field capacity. I call that drowning soil. We overwater our plants dramatically. And what have we learned in our fertilizing practices, whether organic or conventional? We have learned to fill the elevator shaft with fertilizers and water. So now plants can absorb that. And I don't want to make it ridiculous, but this is, this is our actual status. This is how we do things. And it's not correct. It's simply not correct. Because we are, if you have your elevator shafts or your macro pores full with water, you are asking for Fusarium, you're asking for diseases. Because these nasty buggers, they are called omicates or water fungi. They love anaerobic conditions. Actually, they can only grow under anaerobic conditions. And what will happen with the roots in these elevator shafts? They will drown, they will die. Because they need oxygen. And for that reason, if you look in the soil, please go ahead, take the soil in your hands, and take an enlargement glass and start looking. I don't know who already looks at soil. I guess all of you do, because you're interested, you're here, even at this time on Sunday evening. Um, so you are. The absorption zone of any root, and when I talk about roots, I talk about this size, 0.2 mil. Here's 0.4. Here's now 0.2. Um, it's limited to 2 millimeters outside the root. You know what? That roots absorb no further away than two millimeters around, and then the root hairs. Yeah, this is an artist's impression. That means that all the minerals are, that come from outside the two millimeters are not absorbed. They're not used and not buffered. That means that would be very primitive. Plants know that. Plants know their root system is very inefficient. But they don't need to make it more efficient, and then you need that for the brassicas. They don't need to make it more efficient because they have the fungi. So from the day that plants started growing on Earth, they've always lived in combination with mycorrhizal fungi. We, when we talk about agriculture, it's always endomycorrhizal. And there's 143 endomycorrhizae that form these shapes inside. We call them arbusculars. These are vesicles. These are uh, storage, um, storage um, things. Um, these are spores. The root comes in the neighborhood of a spore. The exudates have a signaling function. The root, the spore starts germinating with a few uh, hyphae. Hyphae grow in the roots, and from there they go further. And they make a huge dense web, up to one kilometer of hyphae per cubic centimeter of soil. I, I cannot count in inches. I know an inch is 
2.54 centimeter, but that's it. Um, so now, this is your absorption system. And now water and minerals are available. And this gives you an answer to the first three pictures. How can these plants grow here? How can, how can trees grow in, this, in the desert? How, how can plants survive drought? Well, because the hyphae grow in the micropores, and that's where the water is stored. There's where, there's where um, uh, the, the water is stored in a condensed form. We cannot even see or feel that. So compared to non-mycorrhizal roots, you have a seven times higher absorption capacity, and that's average. Some literature talks about 15 times more, which I can imagine under circumstances. But anyway, you will have an optimal mineral absorption because the plant is paying a lot for these fungi in order to have them work and do. They pay them a good and a fair salary with benefits. Because plants depend on the mycorrhizae. And the mycorrhizae depend on the plant because they cannot photosynthesize. So where else could they have their food from? So if I would be a mycorrhizae fungus, I would really take care of my boss. Because if he dies, I die with him. So when you talk about exudates, these are non-mycorrhizal roots and these are mycorrhizal roots. They, they have much more exudates. They send out information. They send out sugars. They send out acids. They do anything to get the minerals in, in the form of nutrients. And the mycorrhizae transports all the nutrients inside the plant. And how does that look? How come you don't see it in the field? Because these fungi, they grow in the root. You cannot see them. Endomycorrhizae grow in. And the hyphae are way too thin. They're three, four, ten micron thick. You cannot see them. They're translucent. So this is how they really look. And they, these high feet they can grow up to 30, 40 centimeters sometimes. So can you imagine how much absorbing network and communication network is being formed around that root? All All forms of life, I limit this to the ground, okay, to the soil. All forms of life are food for other organisms. And sometimes when I hear from farmers, I have a nematode problem. Or how do, how do you call the yellow bastards that grow into, uh, gr uh, uh, into potatoes? Yeah. Wire worms, thank you. Yeah. The question should be, how come these wire worms here? Why are they eating my potatoes? If a farmer tells me I have a nematode problem, I correct him and, or her, and I say, I'm sorry, you have a fungal problem. You have a real serious fungal problem. So if you just saw a nematode eating nematode, they will never hurt, harm plants. They're too big to harm plants. So out of the more than 1,200 species of nematodes, 26 are considered to be harmful to plants. 26. I need a ne nematodal killing stuff. Yeah, well, kill off 1,200 species. If there's no need to. They take what they need if they have a mycorrhizal colonization. But most potting soil mixes are made on the assumption that roots absorb water and minerals. Book work, not life work. So, yeah, and of course you want to make an ideal mix. 
and you can make ideal mixes. Of course, you, you know what the needs of a plant are, just in average. So you mix the right thing based on, on the knowledge. But even then, the mycorrhizal fungi will determine together with the plant. They will communicate. What, what do you need? Well, yeah, well, since you're there, uh, um, I need some water and, and, oh, I want a flower. Bring some molybdenum, please. And no more borium today. Thank you. I've had enough. So plants determine that. So, yes, make a nice bed for a plant to start with. So mix the good stuff in potting soils. Because when it's on only compost, they will die. <laughs> and if it's uh, only minerals, they will die. And Correct. These problems you face a lot less if you have a very heavily mycorrhized plant. And we have experienced that now over 20 years. Absolutely. But don't prepackage that. Don't put mycorrhizal spores in, in the potting mix in, and, and bag it because they won't survive. Potting mixes are way too wet to keep the spores alive. You, you've never bought a bag of potting soil with grass seed in it, did you? No. Would be impossible. Very logic, because grass seed is a living thing. Mycorrhizal spores too. This is how we defend ourselves. Yeah? This is how roots defend themselves. Fine defensive situations. And if a nematode and they're blind, so they don't know what they do. But if they swim into this defense system, they will not make it. They will not make it. Fungi have found at least 50 ways to catch nematodes. Why? Because nematodes always contain a little more nitrogen and a little more proteins than any Organic plant-based material, they love meat. Fungi love meat. So fungi have found 50 ways to catch nematodes. Or wireworms. Or any larvae that you don't want. Everything in the soil is food for another organism. So an excess of insects means simply not enough fungi. Wow, that's nice. Never seen that. <laughs> and even the nematode eggs are consumed. Okay. This is all on a very small scale. Let's talk about turtles. Turtles crawl on the beach. They dig a hole, put their eggs in there, close the sand go away, and, when the, and then day comes that these little eggs, they hatch. And these nice little sweet turtles, they come out and they want to go to the beach. But the mammals, the birds, they hear the eggs hatching, they, they see food. And the few that make it to the shoreline are eaten by fish. One out of every 1,400 turtles makes it the first year. Now imagine that all the eggs would hatch and they would have no natural predators. How would the world look in two years' time? You can walk to Europe. <laughs> so, please... Try to look through my eyes. If you have a nematode problem, it is because you don't have the fungi that you need. And most, the, the reason why turtles produce so many eggs, the reason why nematodes and all insects produce so many eggs, is because they know that mo the majority will be eaten. They know. And it's not new. This book is 
15 years old. The information is there for whoever wants to have it. Folio feeding. I don't understand the discussion about folio feeding. I read very serious material from important universities. And I read that folio feeding is not very useful because on the upper, upside, upper side of the leaves you only have few stomata. And therefore, folio feeding is not relevant. And I think, this is not true. I'm not reading this. This is the total fruitcake. This is, the guy is nuts. Have you ever been drinking water through your lungs? It's impossible. Stomata are not for absorption. They're for breathing. Not for fertilizer absorption. It's, it's crazy, and it's in serious literature. And it makes me sad. I used, it used to make me mad. But at my age, it makes me sad. So, folio feeding is the most normal thing in the world. I've never seen, and I come many places. I'm very privileged. I, <coughs> I travel the world. I come many places. This is how a natural forest looks like. And this is on three meter high. You see the mosses, you see the ferns, you see the epiphytes, and you see how dirty the leaves are. Foliar feeding is totally natural. Because all the vegetables, vegetables that you grow, all the plants that you grow, that we use as food, also the oranges and whatever <laughs> tree, that production tree, that you fruit tree, are they the largest in the forest? No. They were always understory plants. Always. There. Your fruit tree would fit there. And every canopy would, my, I mean, it's the bird shit, it's a humified product, it's organic matter. Everything trickles down on the leaves below because there is so, so little light, leaves couldn't be possibly feed the plant. Plus, there is a huge root competition. If these plants would not be fed by the organic matter and the amino acids coming from above, they wouldn't be there. We invented salad fields. Nature didn't. So foliar feeding is not a luxury, it's a must. Especially if you want to produce. If you want to produce, feed your plants properly. Low nitrogen, never more than 3%, and if possible, with amino acids, but only plant-based amino acids. The difference between plant-based and animal-based amino acids are two amino acids, two. And these two, you can look that up. I'm not going to tell you. These two, um, they work opposite. They are only present in animal uh, substances, animal amino acids. We always check on it and only use plant-based amino acids. Which is logic. You, you don't spray animals over your plants. Do you? Healthy leaves are not clean. They're full of algae, of epiphytes. You see that? Mosses. They do their work. They do what they need to do. They're never clean. If you see the oranges, in, in these forests, if you see wild oranges, they taste fantastic, but they are brown, dark brown. 
full with algae. And you wash them, they're nicely orange. So that's why I want to talk about smoking. No, I don't. We call this process endocytosis. Get nicotine inside your body by this process, endocytosis. And you stick that on your arm, and exactly the same happens in plant leaves. Most plant leaves, they absorb water and minerals, uh, and, and your fertilizer, of course, through endocytosis. They're literally, the elements are literally grabbed, transported in a cell, into the membranes, into the plant. Please read about endocytosis and forget about stomata. Definitely, yes, of course. Compost tea is great stuff. It's the crap that rains down from the forest canopy. But I deliberately say crap because you don't know what's inside. And with vegetables, I think I would be very careful. Be very careful with, uh, make sure that you have a very good compost tea. If it becomes anaerobic, in, and that's done within an hour, if it becomes anaerobic, you will have the wrong bacteria there. So make sure it's unbelievably fresh and very aerobic, very well aerated, and otherwise it's going to turn onto you. Um, I don't know the expression, sorry. Okay. Soil erosion. Soil erosion, this is in Peru. Look at all the eroded soils. And this is in Spain. Look here. All the good stuff is washed down. Because then my tractor goes down and I, I get pain in my back. <laughs> That's, these are, are the arguments that we get. Really? Uh, I, you're totally right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, and, and, and the good tractor has a chair, but anyway. Um, but this is soil erosion. The funny thing is, all research that I've ever read is about slopes and hills related to soil erosion. But what is keeping the soil together? Who? For sure. Fungi. Fungi hold the soil together. It's the fungi that enmesh the aggregates. They, that's organic matter, that's mineral. You see few hyphae in the organic matter, lots in the mineral, because it's a lot more mining activity. This is glomaline. Well, this photo is from um, Sarah Wright. It's on the internet. And glomaline, you've probably heard about it. Glomaline, we call it the super glue of the soil. And the beauty of glomaline is it is a very, very persistent chemical. It lasts forever. And it glues the soil particles together. And it produces aggregates. And if you have an aggregated soil by glomaline, you won't have compaction anymore. As simple as that. You will have large aggregates that actually grow every year. And these aggregates, they make sure that your soil is always rich in, in oxygen and always in a very good gas diffusion mode because carbon dioxide is more heavy than oxygen. So if you want ex carbon dioxide to go out of the soil, the element has to hook on to oxygen in order to get out. That's called diffusion. And I don't need words for this little film. And this is what you can do for yourself. This is my ultimate soil test. Yeah. 
That's what I call vertical erosion. And if you ever wonder why agriculture loses so much organic matter, and why it's so hard to build up organic matter in the soil? Because it leaches out like nothing else. In the most vertical or horizontal soils, it leaches out. If your soil is sick, this will happen. And look here. The minerals are still falling out because of the water pressure, but that's the only reason. The water pressure. But the water stays clean, and here the organic matter leaches out. So there you go. Farmers invest a lot of money in destroying their soils, year after year. And you have very, very good conventional farmers, and you have very, very good organic farmers, but we also have to face that we have very bad organic farmers and very bad conventional farmers. And good farming starts with the most valuable asset that you have, the soil. Now, this was on a research station in Wageningen in the Netherlands. This is what happened. Chemical anal analysis were exactly the same, and this is the difference between these two soils. This is under the microscope. Here you see separated particles, and there you see aggregated forms. Please do this for yourself. Find out. Then I need to say this because there's too much discussion on nitrogen. To produce one kilogram of nitrogen, you need 36 megajoule energy. That's, that equals one liter diesel oil. And that gives you three and a half kilogram per, uh, of carbon dioxide per kilo nitrogen. That's only the production. Because if you put that nitrogen on your soil, it will kill off the soil life, make your soil less functional, be, will, um, uh, lose, you will lose your aggregated soil, you will have more methane gas, less oxygen, and that gives you, an, it equals 8.8 .8 ton of carbon dioxide equivalents per hectare. Chemical fertilizers may have been feeding the world, and I know 50% of the world is here because we have the fertilizers, but it's our largest environmental problem, by far. And Nobody seems to want to hear. And we laugh about it in, in Europe, but corn growers that grow corn in the Midwest and they put fertilizer on the soil and then they make fuel out of the corn. <laughs> uh, I'm too stupid to realize this. I, d I don't understand, but that's me. So, and you know, in the future, also organic farmers, because we will have diseases. We will have failures. But your, your drone will provide the right bacteria, the right amino acids right in time, because your drone will fly over your land at night and monitor your plants. Ooh, there we have a breakout from aphids. Let's put in some aphid-eating bacteria, ready. The current chemical, the current chemical <laughs> companies, the pharmaceutical companies, they will have a huge problem in the near future in agriculture because the world knows it has to change. We've done this game for 100 years now, and it's ending. And thanks to you, organic farmers, because the world depends on you. Thank you for that. I know we're over time. Brassicas. Brassicas don't have a colonization with mycorrhizae. But that's the reason why they have a huge root system. They depend on bacteria. 
So if you compare uh, a kale or a cauliflower with onions, you will see, you will know. But they depend on bacteria. But they are also tricky bastards because they make the same exudates as any other plant. And that these exudates contain a chemical, it's called formuminetin. That was quick, formuminetin. And that chemical wakes up mycorrhizal spores. And then the spore starts germinating. And then the brassica says to the uh, spore, ha <laughs> <laughs> Tricked you because they have such a, a huge root system, they have, it's their, almost their life duty to get rid of the mycorrhizae in their neighborhood because that, that would be competing with them. Mycorrhizal plants are, they outcompete the brassicas in no time. There's a lot of research on that. But so, so you know. If you have brassicas in your field, in your, in your plan, fine. But realize that you got rid of your mycorrhizal fungi. So you have to re-inoculate your soil. So save some money from your harvest to buy mycorrhizae and put them back in the soil again. Put the plant in the compost. Put any plant in the compost, will die. Right? So, if you make compost, put a thin layer on the ground, not in the ground. Compost contains composting organisms, thermophilic organisms. They don't provide your soil with soil life, they provide your soil with life. So, we would say, bring on compost, fine, thin layer, on top of the ground, after you have your seeding, after you have your uh, little work that you do, your no-till action. Um, but compost for sure does not contain rhizobacteria because it was too hot. So you have thermophilic organisms in your compost. Only when it's very cold and uh, my simple way of testing compost is maybe too simple to determine whether you have a good compost or not. Put it in a plastic bag, knot it, and open it after a week and smell like this. If you get a fist in your face from the ammonia, you know it's not ripe. Um, so, um, and that's what I see. On many farms, the compost that is being brought on the farm is even is even uh, sm smoking. No, how do you call it? Damping off? Mm. I don't know the word. Steaming. Steaming, yeah. And only when the temperature decreases to under 25 degrees, there you will have organisms that actually make start making humus. You need actinomycetes and streptomycetes to do that where the roots are or soon will be. Never through drip irrigation. I don't know who made that up. It, I, I read it on packaging, which is total crap. And never by spreading or surface ap application. The spores are too big. They're 0.2 mil. They're too big. You cannot wash in a ping pong ball. Yeah, that's perfect. Seedling dipping is perfect. Young plants growing in mycorrhizae, perfect. And then you spread the mycorrhizae over your land. That's a very good question. But the knowledge on the phylosphere is so limited, and even by, uh, by us. But we know that the phylosphere bacteria are also part of the endosphere bacteria. So they, co they come out of the plant and they cover the leaves. That's what they do. And they, they come out of the root hairs and they cover the root hairs through the same endocytosis system in a reversed form. Uh, that, that's pretty new technology, but that's how it goes. So, but feeding, feeding your uh, 
uh, leave biota with um, amino acids, with uh, composting, it's fantastic. And the more bacteria you have on your leaves, the better it is. Okay? You had a question. Uh, I've, I've never seen cup, uh, plants that grow on, on plastic cups and forks and knives. So. Oh, you mean that? No, I don't know. Uh, I, I couldn't answer the question. Um, yeah. Uh, I know from the, from the German composters, they now wrote a letter to the German authorities that they hate that compostable plastic in their compost because it doesn't break down well enough. But it's not my expertise. But, but we do it in a fermentation vessel because we cannot sell you pathogens. And if you want to spread your own pathogens, feel free. <laughs> you haven't been here all the time, huh? No, I'm uh-uh. Because I answered that question already. Um, you're right. Okay, that's the second question is... No. No. Not a concern. I would, nev I would never put both in one package because they need uh, another storage um, moisture level. Uh, so always keep asking questions. And if they don't put on the label exactly what's in there, don't buy it. Trichoderma is a fungal eating fungus. And it's, it's rootless. So in sterile soils, like potting soils, trichoderma is used a lot, so you have some fungus, which offers some protection, fine, but it also blocks the way for other fungi. Like mushroom growers, they hate trichoderma. So, because it's consuming other fungi. So, the trichoderma thing is a hype. There's this company now in the Netherlands, I know, and it's called sensoterra.com, and they sell worldwide. And we, in, in Saudi Arabia and Dubai and Abu Dhabi and other countries, we use the, their sensors. Why? Because they are cheap. They last eight years. They are 15, 30, 45, 60, 90 centimeters. So you buy a bunch, and you monitor the moisture levels on your phone. And that's where you find the sweet spot. Because if you irrigate, you can see, okay, number one, 15 centimeters coming in, two, three. So you can also learn how fast your water will disappear from you with a lack of holding capacity. Yeah, because there, there's no wind. They, they don't have to defend themselves against the wind. There's no physical forces. Of course they grow better. If you shake tomatoes, they don't grow anymore. They, they, because they start forming fibers, and that takes energy. So shake tomatoes, they stop growing. Hang them on the line, and they will produce. <laughs> OK? Uh, thank you for being here. I'm way over time. Thank you. <laughs>